I'm glad that this, we didn't get snowed out. I heard that was a distinct possibility. When I woke up this morning in Waco, Texas, where I live uh, right next door to Chip and Joanne, which is not, no, it's not true. Um, uh, there was actually snow on the ground in Waco. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, so there was a, uh, I had a sense that I, it may not happen, but I'm delighted that it did happen. So it, it's great to be here. Uh, as Nina said, uh, the talk this evening is going to be on the Catholic doctrine of justification, or to put it in the form of a question, what must I do to be saved? And what I'm going to share with you this evening is largely the result of my own journey back to the Catholic Church. I grew up uh, Catholic. I was uh, baptized, confirmed, and went to First Holy Communion as a Catholic. I went to 12 years of Catholic school. Uh, but when I was a teenager, I was kind of drawn away from the church, and I found myself uh, deeply involved with evangelical Protestantism. Um, the trajectory of my life from that point forward, though, led me uh, to be in, interested in philosophy and theology. So after college, I went off to Fordham University where I did my doctorate in philosophy. And it was only uh, 12 years ago, which is how many, 12, 13, almost 13 years ago now, <coughs> that I returned to the church. And uh, there were four issues that initially <coughs> prevented me from c seriously considering Catholicism. One was the doctrine of the Eucharist. The other was the doctrine of penance, or the sacrament of penance. The third was apostolic succession, and the fourth was the doctrine of justification. Uh, I can talk about all four, but I'm here to talk about just one of them, the doctrine of justification. But I will tell you that of all of them, uh, the one that was initially the most difficult was the doctrine of justification. The others actually weren't that difficult. In fact, in some ways, when I came to the conclusion that the church was right about the Eucharist, penance, and apostolic succession, it actually made the doctrine of justification easier to be able to assess. Uh, now, you may ask, what about these other issues, like the ones that typically come up in discussions with, with Protestants and evangelicals, things like praying to the saints, uh, purgatory, and so forth. In my mind, if the church was right about penance, the Eucharist, apostolic succession, and the doctrine of justification, then the others sort of fell into place. That is, because those doctrines, especially the doctrine of purgatory and the relationship that Christians have both here in this world and in the afterlife in terms of prayer and its efficacious nature, kind of fits in with the Catholic understanding of what it means to actually be justified, that is, to be right with God. So what you're going to hear this evening is a kind of how I thought through this and how I was able to work through it and how I came to the conclusion that uh, the Catholic view is, in fact, the correct view. Now, I want to have a caveat here. I'm not saying that all my Protestant friends who have a different reading of Scripture and history are irrational. <laughs> uh, I think that there's a way to read the Scripture that gets their view. But I think if you look at the way in which the church uh, in history has wrestled with this question, that I think that the Catholic understanding of Scripture and how to read the passages of Scripture that are disputed, I think makes the most sense. So uh, I do want to mention one thing. I did write a little memoir about my return to the church called Return to Rome. Um, came out, that picture is me, my first Holy Communion picture. Uh, kind of cute. You know, time has uh, has altered that, but uh, uh, so it's, and I'm smiling, so I must have been must have been happy. So, all right, um, we're going to talk about a few things that are a little technical. So I'm going to try my best to explain it in a way like I would in a classroom situation at Baylor. Uh, I teach uh, different courses at Baylor, including a course on on Christian belief and uh, faith and reason. I also teach courses in law and political philosophy. So I'm going to, most of you are undergraduates, I suspect. Uh, so I'm going to treat this as if I'm in a class without a blackboard. I just have to rely on my own wits, uh, which could be 
deleterious, but uh, uh, nevertheless. Um, so what, uh, when we talk about, um, oh, by the way, you should all have a, 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 a sheet. If, um, I printed out 70 of them this morning. You can have one there on the table. Yeah, you can thank Baylor University for helping to. Uh, <laughs> I use the copy machine there. When we talk about justification, think about it this way. Um, what does it mean to be right with God? So typically the way in which uh, if you uh, think of, for example, some many of us remember a Billy Graham crusade. Right, Billy Graham will give a wonderful sermon and then ask people to come to the front, right, to give their life to Christ. And uh, I always wanted Billy Graham to say something like this You up in the balcony, take that leap of faith. <laughs> <laughs> Just it. Billy Graham was wonderful. Um, so Graham would, would, you know, he asked people to come up for the altar call. And people will say, this is the day that I got saved. And in fact, there's a famous hymn that I used to, we used to sing when I was in, uh, when I was attending evangelical churches. And it was, it, it would go, so I'm not going to try to sing it. It would go, it was on a Monday, somebody touched me. It was on a Monday, somebody touched me. Must have been the hand of the Lord. And then they go through every day of the week. It was on a Tuesday. Somebody touched me. Must have been the hand of the Lord. And that, in the minds of a lot of evangelical Protestants, is the time in which they believe that they were justified and made right with God. The Catholic view is not that view. It's, it, it's, it's similar to it, but it's not exactly like it. And to understand the differences, we have to kind of do a little bit of an excursion into history. So during the time which we call the Reformation, roughly beginning of the 16th century, 1517 is the time in which Martin Luther, October 31st, it was Halloween, well, they didn't know it was Halloween. October 3rd, it was also Nevada Day, by the way. That's the day Nevada entered the Union, October 31st. I know this because I grew up in Las Vegas. So uh, we, had, we had Halloween off every year. So October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther uh, nails his 95 theses to the, Wittner, to the door of the Wittenberg Church. And there he lists his grievances with the Catholic Church. Now, several years later, he begins to develop an understanding of justification or how we get right with God. And in a more sophisticated fashion, his followers, uh, people like a gentleman named Melanchthon and then others who start other movements like John Calvin, begin making a distinction between justification and sanctification. And what they argue is that um, that when, God bless you. <laughs> We can do that here, can we? Yes. Okay. Uh, so just justification is uh, what they, they use this kind of language, that justification is a forensic declaration that believers are made righteous. And that's a, actually a quote from a book by Alistair McGrath, who's an uh, evangelical scholar uh, who I believe is at Oxford University. He wrote actually a, 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 a magnificent book on the whole history of, of the doctrine of justification. So one of the essential aspects is that, th that justification is a forensic declaration. What does that mean? It means that God declares you justified even though there has been no internal change in you. So it would be like this. Supposing um, you're in a court of law, you're, you're up on a, a, a criminal offense, you've uh, uh, been declared guilty, but somebody else is willing to take the punishment for you. And then you're declared not guilty, even though you are still intrinsically guilty. Now, according to this way of thinking about justification, uh, that's not the end of the road, right? So sometimes uh, the evangelical Protestant view, I think, is caricatured by Catholics. They say, oh, all you have to do is, you know, walk up the altar and you can live any way you want. Well, 
that's not quite right. The, the evangelical view is that, uh, that God, when you are justified, God pours, out the whole, pours the Holy Spirit into your heart to permit you to be able to become sanctified. That is to say, to become holy. But you, aren't, you don't become holy in order to be worthy of the beatific vision, as Catholics would put it, or to get into heaven. So the view embraced by most evangelical Protestants is, is this view that justification is about God declaring you justified or imputing to you the righteousness of Christ. What does that mean to impute? It means that, that the righteousness of Christ covers up your sin. Obviously, it, you, you're forgiven of your sin, but in terms of you, you're still unworthy. It's the Christ's righteousness that makes you worthy. So it's imputed to you. It's not infused in you. The Catholic view is that righteousness is infused in you. Right. I'll have more to say about that in a few minutes. Um, so important terms here to remember. Um, you, you may have heard these terms. They're, they're Latin phrases, sola fide, sola gratia. What does that mean? Faith alone and grace alone. And so if you ever read any books on the Reformation or any scholars in the Reformation or any Reformed scholars, they will reel off the solas. Sola scriptura, sola fide, uh, and so forth, and sola gratia. Um, the Catholic view of justification, and it took me a while to sort of understand and grasp this because there's a sense in which I think the Catholic view is sometimes caricatured. So uh, when I was uh, a young evangelical, uh, I was a, when I was in, a freshman in college, I led a Bible study at my parents' home. My parents were Catholic and they let me do this. God bless them. They, uh, they really had, I, I, would, I don't know if I'd let, uh, <laughs> but they were Catholic and they wanted, they wanted, uh, they, they just, they said, I'd like to host a Bible study. And so one of the weeks, in fact, I, I, the reason why I mention this is that when my wife and I moved last year, I found a file of my old notes from those Bible studies. And in those notes, I actually had us, we met one week and talked about Catholicism. And it was sort of embarrassing to look at these notes now. Because I was in my parents' home, who, they were both Catholic, both raised, they both raised me Catholic, and here I was leading a Bible study telling fellow Protestants why Catholicism was wrong. And one of the things that I said, and I saw it in the notes, I said, Catholics believe that you have to work your way to salvation. And that's absolutely false. But that's what I believed. And the reason for that is that sometimes in Catholic culture, it can come across that way. It can, it, can, it can be portrayed that way. And the other thing is that Catholics themselves don't know enough about their own view. So my parents couldn't have corrected me even if they wanted to, right? Uh, but as I look back, I see the meaning of grace and Catholicism as they lived out their lives. And I'll, I got more to say about that in a few minutes. So one of the things that I, that I sort of couldn't figure out is how is it that on the one hand the Catholic Church, and this was about maybe 13 years ago or so when I was thinking about returning, that how is it that the Catholic Church on the one hand can, can, can sound like evangelicals and say sola gratia, Faith, or excuse me, grace alone. On the other hand, there's so much of Catholic life that involves us doing stuff, right? Going to Mass, receiving the sacraments, engaging in works of charity. So how is it that the Church teaches, on the one hand, just like Protestants teach, that it is by grace alone? On the other hand, though, there's a part that we play in our own justification, right? I think the problem has to do with the Catholic view, at least the Catholicism, just not on this issue, but on many others, is never an either or thing. It's, it's a both and thing. So think about something like um, our view, 
that we share with Protestants that the Bible is God's Word. But yet we often talk about books of the Bible in terms of their human authors. We'll say, what are you reading? Well, I'm reading Romans. Well, who wrote Romans? Paul. Oh, I thought God wrote it. <laughs> right? So it's weird. We, we actually believe that something can be both authored by a human being and yet also authored by God. And the reason for this is that part of the Catholic view, and one that, we, that many Protestants share with us, is that when we talk about divine action or how God acts in the world, it's not a zero-sum game. It's that God can both... In other words, God doesn't need room to act. He doesn't need space. He doesn't need gaps. But if you think of God's action as requiring space, it's going to seem as though it's either works or grace. So the, the analogy with Scripture, I think, makes the most sense. In fact, that was the thing that really changed the way that I thought about the doctrine of justification. The other was the, the nature of the Incarnation. When we talk about Christ being both God and man. So if you look in the history of the church, the greatest heresies are always attempts to take a both and and turn it into an either or. Right? So you go to the Christological debates about Christology. It's like, I think I can figure out who Jesus really was. He's kind of a combination of God and man, like half God, half man. No, heresy. <laughs> oh, no, no. He's fully God, but he just looks like a man. Nope, wrong. <laughs> you know, so it's the same thing with faith and works. That is, that it's not an either or, it's a both and. So, what is the what is the, the Catholic, the Catholic view? Um, so here I'm going to quote from the the catechism. Um, the, this is a Three very brief paragraphs. The grace of the Holy Spirit has the power to justify us, that is, to cleanse us from our sins and to communicate to us righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ and through baptism. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we take part in Christ's passion by dying to sin and in his resurrection by being born into a, born to a new life. We are members of his body, which is the church, branches grafted into the vine, which is himself. The first work of the grace uh, of the grace of the Holy Spirit is conversion, affecting justification in accordance with Jesus' proclamation at the beginning of the gospel. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Moved by grace, man turns toward God and away from sin, thus accepting forgiveness and righteousness from on high. So, but but on the Catholic view, this is just the beginning of the journey. So there's a sense in which when an infant is baptized or an adult is received into the church, that person receives grace, but it isn't merely a declaration. On the Catholic view, and I think the, the view of the ancient church, which I'll make a case for uh, in a few minutes, that grace is real stuff. It can actually change nature. In fact, there's a kind of phrase that's often used by Catholic theologians and uh, that grace changes nature. That is, if you think of grace as being something real, and in that sense, it's not simply a matter of God declaring. It's a matter of him doing that, but as well as changing you. And so Thomas Aquinas will often talk about, the, he talks about in, his, in the, the section of the Summa called the Treatise on Grace, the difference between uh, operating and cooperating grace. Uh, he'll talk about what's called habitual grace. And what he's trying to do there is to try to make sense of passages of Scripture that on the one hand say it's a totally a free gift, and yet we have to do things. And I think the one way in which people read those passages is that, oh, it must be the parts that talk about us doing things it, it, it can't really mean that that has any basis in our justification. So it's all, it's that we don't have any involvement. That's I, think, that's, I think, the mistake that some of our Protestant friends make. The other extreme is to say, well, it's just, it really works and God helps us, which is the mistake that an ancient uh, monk named Pelagius made, that we don't need grace. The Catholic view is that... Um, 
that 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 both are involved. So, uh, so it's the beginning of the journey. Um, so, so for for one that after one is receiving the church either at baptism or uh, later in life, or, or as an infant or later in life, obviously both in both cases one is baptized. Uh, how one exercises one's faith is itself a gift of God's grace. And you do that through various means or various ways, in acts of charity, the spiritual disciplines, prayer, as well as partaking in the sacraments. All this is done in order to commune with God and so receive his unmerited grace so that we can become conformed to the image of Christ, as Paul says. Uh, so for the Catholic, justification refers not only to the Christian's initial entrance in the family of God at baptism, which is administered for the remission of sins, but also to the intrinsic work of both the infusion of that grace of baptism and all the subsequent graces and work in concert to transform the Christian from the inside out. And there's a mystery here. You know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. One of the things that, that really struck me when I returned to the church, uh, Catholics are, are, are kind of well known in the, um, you know, in sort of the more general academic world of being the, uh, the one, this rich intellectual tradition, right? So we have the Thomistic Institute, and you have a pretty fair number of folks here, right? Thus proving that, in a sense. Um, and so people tend to think, oh, so faith is always about reason. But that's not what the church teaches. The church teaches that faith and reason are two different ways that we can know something, but that they complement each other. So here's another case where another where an either or or a both and is turned into an either or. So one of the issues that 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 I think is uh, that one faces uh, today in the in the contemporary academy is the attempt to sort of try to show that every article of faith that we believe can be subsumed under uh, rational argument. But that's not what the church has ever taught. The church has taught that there are many things that we can know through reason. These are sometimes called the preambles of faith. That's the term that's used by Thomas Aquinas. But then there are things that we can only know through faith. And those are called the articles of faith. And the how God sort of kind of reconciles uh, the, the role of grace with our own activities is a kind of mysterious thing. And as I've gotten older, I actually like the fact that there's a lot of mystery in my faith. I, you know, I actually, when I was younger and I was a, when I was a new philosophy professor, I thought that I had to sort of figure everything out in order to have a, in order to be, in order to have really authentic faith. And there is something deeply liberating by seeing that, uh, in fact, there's more to the life of faith and sort of figuring everything out. Figuring everything out is kind of fun, right? I love arguments just as much as the next guy, but it's not all about arguments, right? It's also about assenting to what one may have reason to believe, but ultimately it's really that grace that kind of leads you to assent, right? Uh, I, there are things that I now believe, arguments now that I accept as a Catholic mm -hmm that I can't figure out why I rejected them when I was a Protestant. Have you ever had this phenomenon where you've changed your mind about something and then all of a sudden you think, you look back and go, I heard that argument eight years ago. Well, some of you were like 12, so maybe that says that. But for me, eight years ago was like yesterday. Um, so there, there may be an argument that I heard maybe 20 years ago that some Catholic friend gave me. And I just dismissed it. Now I go, wow, that was a really good argument. What was I missing? And I think what I was missing was the grace of God, right? And I think that, that sometimes can be uh, the difference. All right. Let me say a few things, um, a couple of other things about the Catholic view of justification. Um, justification for the Catholic is not merely about it's not an accounting enterprise. So it isn't like a balance sheet, right? Think of justification, uh, um, I'm sorry for accounting majors here. If you, uh, uh, it, it's about a rightly ordered self, right? 
So justification is, is, not, is not just about sort of, oh, kind of checking off the right things that you've done. It's actually about grace transforming you as you cooperate with the grace that God has given you. So think of it this way. Um, do you remember the, you should all know, um, the parable of the um, ungrateful servant. I think that's the, the, the name of it. Um, it's one that I've, I've, I just published a, a book uh, with Baylor University Press called Never Doubt Thomas, and the subtitle is The Catholic Aquinas is Evangelical and Protestant. It's actually an ironic subtitle. I'm not saying that Thomas says, oh my gosh, he's, I'm not saying Thomas Aquinas uh, is a Protestant, but uh, in the book I have a section dealing with the, um, the doctrine of purgatory, and in order to try to explain it, I, I, I use that, past, that, that section of scripture where there's this servant, um, he owes his, uh, his master, um, you know, he's lent, uh, the master's lent him money, uh, the master is merciful to him, and he says, um, um, you know, uh, I'm going to forgive you or give you time to pay off the debt. Fine. But then this servant himself has a servant, and he's unforgiving to the, to the servant. He's ungrateful. And what happens is that the, the master hears of this, and he's really upset, and he says, You're, it's going to be worse for you now, right? Now, what's interesting about that story is that, is that it isn't as if the servant was somehow working to earn the trust of the master. It's that the master gave him grace, right? And he blew it, right? So if you think about it, that's the way at least the church teaches about how cooperating and operating grace work. What's operating grace? It means the initial grace you get at baptism, right? And it's sometimes called sanctifying grace. Cooperating grace is a kind of another way of looking at sanctifying grace from another angle. It's, it's the grace. So one has to do with how God changes our being, to use sort of technical Thomas terms. God changes our being. The other is how we act. So it's about being an act. And so if you go to the parable, it's, in a sense, the master said, I'm going to change your being. <laughs> but what did he do with that grace? He didn't act. Right? So it wasn't that he was condemned because he didn't work his way to please the master. It's he didn't, he wasn't an, a, a good custodian of the grace that he was given. And, and that those, this kind of may help me make sense of other passages of scripture. So there's the one where Jesus talks about the seeds that are thrown. Some fall on stones, some fall on grass, some fall. And, and so it, it, that is talking about what the, the seeds are sort of the gift of grace, right? Or they represent the individuals that are given, uh, given grace. And, but some of them don't actually grow and develop, right? Uh, why? Uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but it's no, in, in none of those places is it, it, is, it, is it portrayed as if it's just a matter of you're working your way to heaven. It's this understanding of a both and rather than an either or. Which, uh, another way to put it, uh, it's kind of a little pithy phrase. Um, justification is not just about getting us into heaven. It's about getting heaven into us. For the Catholic view, the reason why we have to be justified or purified is that we can only see God face to face if, in fact, we have been cleansed fully. And this is why the doctrine of purgatory is so essential to the Catholic view. So if you reject this understanding of grace, it makes sense that purgatory doesn't make any sense. But, the, but, but then there's this problem. And it's a problem that I faced when I was thinking about returning to the church. What do you do about post-baptismal sin? Right? So, you know, as an, as an evangelical Protestant, you know, I believe that Christ saved me, that I was saved by grace. But I, once in a while, did bad things. <laughs> right? I sinned like everybody else. And how do I deal with that? And 
the thing that the Catholic view really helped me think through was the idea that penance, you know, coming, being received back into the church, being welcomed back, again be, having access to that grace. But never did it occur to me that this was a matter of me working my way to heaven. It really was a matter of me freely receiving the grace that the church was offering. In fact, for, for me, the, bet, the, the most important sacrament since returning to the church has been confession. Uh, first time I went to confession in over 30 years was April 24th, 2007. Um, I walked into the confessional and the priest who was from East India, uh, I went to a priest who didn't know me. It's been 30 years, I, you know. Uh, I said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been over 30 years since my last confession. I'm not sure I can remember them all. And he said, that is okay. God knows them. <laughs> and I was afraid of that. <laughs> and he said, I, I said, well, I don't remember. He says, just give me general categories. <laughs> and then we were off and running. And, but for me, the going there and receiving that grace, it didn't seem to me like I was doing, I was trying to earn it. I was there to receive it, right? So I think the thing that, I think the problem with, I think, explaining the Catholic view is that, again, we're sort of caught up in this, it's either one thing or the other. And if it's, and if it's one, it, it, it can, it, 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 it if it's one, it can't be the other, right? They're somehow mutually exclusive. And again, to go back to the, the analogies, if we think about our understanding of the inspiration of Scripture or the understanding of the Incarnation, those are cases that are not just uh, either ors, but, but both ands. So let's talk about, um, I'm gonna talk about what the, the biblical case uh, for the Catholic view. And here I'm gonna have to be quick. I, I've noticed that, uh, I have about what, 15 minutes left or so? Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, so it's under the, the, the heading in the, on the, the notes, what the scriptures tell. Um, there's a passage uh, that's often, that, that was an important passage of scripture for me as, as an evangelical Protestant, Romans chapter four, verses one through eight, and I'll read it to you. Uh, and you can read along, it's on, the, it's on the study sheet. What then are we to say, uh, what then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to, now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, as something due, but to one who, without works, trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. So also, David speaks of the blessedness of those to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one against whom the Lord will reckon him. Uh, this passage is often cited as a sort of definitive presentation of this idea of forensic justification. But it seems to me that if you look at Abraham and his life and the other places in which Abraham is mentioned in the New Testament as having faith, it's not the sort of once and for all justification that is often portrayed uh, by, by Protestant writers. So verse 3. It says, from what we just read, Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness. That's actually from uh, the citation is Exodus 15, 6, which tells us that Abraham believed God after the, after the Lord promised him numerous descendants. Yet James chapter 2, verses 21 through 24, states that Abraham's faith was actually just justified him years after that incident when he obeyed God and attempted to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice in Genesis chapter 22. The text claim that when Abraham performed this work, quote, the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. However, the book of Hebrews teaches that Abraham was a man of faith chronologically prior to either of those two incidents. And so it seemed to me that there's something else going on here 
than a kind of one-time declaration. But a kind of, yes, Abraham is declared righteous, but it has to do with something that God has changed in him that doesn't that, that can be received at different times and it's not a once and for all thing. It isn't like it was on a Monday, somebody touched me, must have been the hand of the Lord. It can, hurt, it can occur many times, even when one is in full communion with Christ. Now, let me say a few things about the, what, I, what, what also occurred to me uh, when I was going to sort of thinking about the issue of, of justification. Uh, other passages of scripture began, I began to read things differently. So there were, there were places in the Bible that I, never occurred to me to be read in a Catholic way. So, for example, what's the difference between the sheeps and the goats in the last judgment? What they did and didn't do, <laughs> right? Um, let me quote here from uh, Matthew 16. Uh, the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay every man for what he has done. Revelation 22. Uh, there's, uh, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense to repay everyone for what he has done. Uh, in Matthew 19, uh, which, from which I just quoted or, or, or uh, cited, uh, Jesus connects the possession of eternal life with keeping his commandments. You know, the, the question asked of the rich young ruler, what must I do to be saved? Jesus said, obey all the commandments. Right? He said, I do that. We'll sell everything you own. Now, Jesus isn't saying that it's a sort of economic, financial, contractual transaction. He's saying, if you sell, he's not saying, I can buy, hey, you want some salvation? I got some for you right here. <laughs> he's not doing that, right? It's, it's, it's a sense of giving of yourself in order to receive the grace. So that's what I began reading in these passages. And as, a, as an evangelical Protestant, I never actually thought about them before. It's kind of weird to think all these passages in the gospel that seem to indicate that one is in fact judged. <laughs> by what one does, right? Now, of course, again, it's not a question of, of a sort of um, eternal um, sort of posthumous balancing, right? Um, it's, it's, it's something quite different from that. And I think later on, as we read the epistles, Paul makes it a little easier to understand. I mean, you read the Gospels and then you read the Epistles, and as the church begins to develop its theology, it becomes it, 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 you you get a little bit more uh, structure uh, to what uh, to what Christ was trying to say. And of course, when Jesus is talking, he is all, he's not t teaching as a theologian. By the way, the Bible is not a theology textbook. You know, um, it's it's just it's not a it, it, it's. My own view as a Catholic is that that's what the church is for, right? To offer the interpretation, to provide structure. Uh, but the Bible is, this is why it's a lot, if you're going to learn about uh, Christianity, it's always better to read stories rather than to sort of hand somebody a systematic theology textbook, right? And that's why Jesus taught that way, so we should, we should take his... Uh, we should follow his example. So, um, I want to say a few things uh, about other passages of Scripture. Um, and I, I cite, uh, I have on the, the study sheet here under Roman numeral 4C, uh, under the title, The Complexity of the Bible's Account. And here, I, I'm not going to be able to read all of them. I'm just going to give you highlights of them. Uh, one finds, for example, um, I've already mentioned Romans chapter 4. I've already talked about the teachings of Jesus. Uh, but one of the things that's interesting, when Paul, when St. Paul is writing about justification, he sometimes talks about it as a past event. He sometimes talks, a bit, uh, talks about it as a, something that's present and continuing. And in other times, he's talking about it as not fully achieved, which is, I think, much, which is consistent with the, with the Catholic view. He often we'll talk about it as a kind of inward transformation. That is, um, that, so for the, one of the most famous passages, Philippians uh, chapter 2, 12 and 13, uh, for instance, 
uh, he tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and troubling, for God is at work in you. And here you have in this passage both, right? It's like, work out your salvation, but it's God working in you. Wow. So it's, it's like you're involved, but you don't get the credit. <laughs> right? Yeah. All right. It's like when I, when I um, empty the um, dishwasher and my wife doesn't notice. <laughs> Actually, she does because I do it so rarely. So. <laughs> so inward transformation, other th other, uh, another aspect of, of, I think, of, of the... Um, of the account found in the Pauline epistles is that justification includes sanctification. Um, so just uh, uh, some examples here. Um, Paul uh, talks about, it often, he, there's a, several passages where he talks about uh, being justified and sanctified. You know, they're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not treated as if they're sort of separate and distinct uh, aspects of one's journey. They're sort of, they're intertwined with each other. What's what, a passage that, 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 that had never stood out to me as pertaining to this issue is one that, that is, is read at almost uh, every wedding, 1 Corinthians 13, you know, the, the famous love uh, passage uh, where Paul talks about the greatest of these is love. Remember what he says that faith, hope, and charity, he, he says that without love, they are what? Nothing. I mean that's a that's about as strong and of a not faith alone passage as you can imagine, right? So faith, hope, and charity—they're together, right? Charity meaning our exercising of that grace in our love, not only for one another but for God, right, and our neighbor, and that's part of the thing that Paul says in Philippians of God working, working through us. I want to conclude with a, just a kind of a brief survey of church history. I know we're we're running we're running short of time, so I uh, I just want to just talk a little bit about something that uh, I think at the end of the day was the was sort of the the deal breaker for me. Um, so I began reading. Uh, so the story that I was told, or the story that I believed as, as an evangelical Protestant was like this. Okay, the early church was right. Um, then, you know, as we entered the Middle Ages, there were great theologians like St. Augustine. Um, but, you know, as we moved into the late Middle Ages, the church got involved with all these things and these beliefs about purgatory and indulgences and the role of priests in, the abs uh, in, in penance and the absolution of, uh, of sin and so forth. And then the Reformation came along and solved everything. The thing that, 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 that I discovered was that that's, that's not true. <laughs> in fact, the thing that really stood out was how Catholic the early church fathers were on the issue of justification. And to give you uh, just, just, one, just one set of examples, um, uh, when, uh, when I was trying to figure out how, where I was going to go in terms of, you know, whether I was going to turn to the church or not, I read several books in which um, um, certain authors would say, would quote from early church fathers. Here I'm talking about individuals writing roughly between the second, maybe the second through the fifth centuries. And they would, and I would read the quotes that they would cite, and they often seem to be perfectly consistent with sort of contemporary Protestant thought. But, but the thing that I that that I missed when I did that was not. It's what they took for granted, not e explicitly what they said. So, for instance, if you go back and read the early liturgies, that is, how they conducted what we would say what we call mass. So one of the things that you, Robert Lewis Wilkin, a great historian at the University of Virginia who's now since retired, uh, wrote this book called Spirit of the Early Church. And in the book he goes through early liturgies, that is third, second, third century. And one of the things that, that is done in those liturgies, and we still do today, we welcome the church both on earth and in heaven. 
to join us. And that just blew my mind. So even though uh, you could read passages from the Church Fathers that sound like they could be from John Calvin or Martin Luther, if you just turn the page, well, uh, and this actually literally happened to me, I, would, uh, I was reading John Chrysostom, who sounded like, he sounded like John Calvin, and then I turned the page and he says, oh, by the way, uh, he didn't say that, that's me, but I said, by the way, he said, uh, this is my paraphrase, uh, talking about should we pray for, uh, you know, wealthy people who have died who we probably think they're lost. And he goes, yes, we should pray for them. Whoa, wait a second, pray for them? You know, that, that's a real Catholic thing to do. And so one of the things that, uh, that I discovered is that there's a continuity that the view of justification that, was, that is held by the Catholic Church in its catechism is the same view that you find in the Council of Trent, which was in response to the Reformation. It's the same view that you find in Thomas Aquinas. It's the same view you find in Augustine. And it's the same view that's found in what is called the Council of Orange, which is uh, a, count, a regional council that uh, was put together to uh, convene to respond to what was called the Pelagian heresy. And the Pelagians, I briefly mentioned Pelagius, he believed that one could uh, be saved without the grace of God. He didn't, and you know why he believed? He denied that baptism was necessary to remove original sin. The Council of Orange wasn't a brief against works righteousness. It was actually a brief against the view that baptism uh, was not necessary, which is a distinctly, not a distinctly, the Eastern Orthodox hold this view as well, that baptism is in fact necessary. So that's justification, and uh, I could talk more about this, but I'm sure you have some questions, so let me open the floor for, for any questions. I see, I see, like a, I see that hand. Yeah, that's really Can you talk a little bit about how like, the Catholic view of justification is tied into the idea of deification? Like, what's kind of the Oh, okay. Of yeah. So the, there's actually, I think, I don't know what church father said it. It might have been, might have been Tertullian. I could, uh, um, he was kind of a bad boy church father. <laughs> he was a church father, but, you know, a little edgy, you know. Uh, so Tertullian, I, I think he said, uh, uh, might have been Origen, that's another one. Uh, uh, maybe I'm citing the wrong church fathers. Uh, uh, that God became man so that we could become like God. Now, of course, you know, uh, that idea is that if you, what they're talking about is what Peter talks about in, in one of his epistles, that, that we, uh, we can, that in a way we can participate in the divine nature. And so the, the idea of deification is that we become, because Christ became man, uh, we have obviously cannot literally become God. That is, that's a heretical view. But in a sense, we can become holy in a way so that we become worthy of seeing him. And so in a sense, by participating in the divine nature, in a sense we become like God. It's not quite, I mean, the problem is that the, the, the langu the, our language today um, is so infused with uh, the idea that, that uh, especially when we're talking about theological topics, we tend to talk about God today in a kind of univocal way. That is that, that the way we use language about ordinary objects, we apply to God in the same way. And so when, 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 when the, the church or even in, in, in Peter talks about uh, um, you know participating in the partaking in the divine nature, which is, is his language, uh, if you take that as sort of like uh, like uh, you know in a kind of literal sense, then you sort of would you would miss it, right? So for for Peter and and for the the church, the, the idea is that um, uh, as we become Conform to the image of Christ in a sense because Christ himself is the God-man we in that sense we partake in the divine nature but we don't get the divine nature we don't become divine right that would because uh, that's impossible we're finite creatures 
I, I hope I don't know if that is helpful or not. Or, you know. yeah, okay, well, <laughs> you're just being nice. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Do you have a particular take on the passage that refers to Jesus being justified in the Spirit? Um, first Corinthians, or first uh, Timothy three sixteen. No, I. I okay. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm. I, you know, this is, I mean, a, I'm just a philosopher, not a biblical scholar. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but that, but it's, 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 a lot of people from different theological takes struggle with that. Passage. Yeah, you know. In fact, I, you know, somebody that I I. Lo I I probably have read on this but have forgotten is uh, Tom Wright, uh, who's actually going to be teaching a one-week intensive course on the book of Galatians at Baylor. Uh, and it happens to be, I would, I would take it, uh, Tom, Tom Wright is a, is a bishop in the Anglican Church and probably the foremost New Testament scholar uh, in the world. Um, uh, but I will actually be that week at Notre Dame speaking and I wish I, you know, I would be, I would re, I'd rather listen to him than uh, than listen to me. So, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you.